So, well, uh, welcome everybody. Great that you're here in this workshop uh, called Create Your Own Quality Engineering Strategy. And it is a workshop, so the idea is that indeed you are going to create your own quality engineering strategy. Um, so, and we have, uh, well, a little over an hour time, so that's great. And let me quickly introduce myself. Uh, I'm principal quality consultant at Society in the Netherlands, and I've been in IT for more than 40 years now. And the thing that always strikes me is that the technological changes have been huge, eh? because when I started, computers looked like this. And uh, But the way how we work together has changed much less. So, um, uh, I, I used to be in an agile team in the 1980s, although back then we didn't know that later it would be called an agile team. Um, I do three kinds of things. I do assignments for clients, uh, consultancy, coaching, that kind of thing. Um, I do training courses and I do research and development. And research and development often uh, ends up in writing about stuff uh, like in books that you see on this slide and talking about stuff like I'm doing today on this conference. Um, and I'm not only involved in quality and testing in my own company, but also in some uh, uh, voluntary positions in the uh, uh, network of testers in the Netherlands called Testnet and uh, in ISTQB. Um so that's basically the introduction. Now, together with a couple of clients, we wrote a book, uh, or now with a couple of colleagues, sorry, with a couple of colleagues, we wrote a book called Quality for DevOps Teams. And we published it in 2020. And in 2022, so last year, we published an update, third edition. And one of the major uh, additions to this update was the quality engineering strategy that is the core of this workshop. Um, generally, if you look at IT today, what you see is business people, they want business value. They don't ask for IT solutions because using IT is a no-brainer. They want business value and they don't like to wait. So they want to have quality at speed. And to be able to make that, um, you need to have quality engineering as a uh, responsibility to everybody involved. And you need to integrate your quality assurance and testing in your IT delivery process, but also in the people. Everybody must be aware of quality. And the focus today is that we have high-performing cross-functional teams that take responsibility for creating stuff but also for making sure that it keeps running. And that's the essence of what you see in DevOps, of course, development and operations in one team. And to meet the quality at speed, you need to automate everything. That is, I don't say you need to really automate everything. You need to automate everything that is useful. So yeah, that's a... Uh, little disclaimer to the word automate everything so we need teams to do the right things the right way at the right moment and therefore we need strategy and that's the core of today now i was talking about business value and business value is very important and it's part of the business delivery so the core of what your organization does um so value is what it all starts with and then you come in the scope of it delivery and the first step is to determine what are the objectives that you need to meet with the it and part of that is making sure you build quality in by using the right quality measures and the quality measures are things that we will definitely see again because in your quality engineering strategy, you will uh, uh, put down what are the quality measures that will be applied so that you can achieve your objectives. And then you want to know if you're actually going towards your objectives. So you need to measure and you need to measure indicators. 
And measuring indicators is mainly testing, which of course is the subject of this conference. And by measuring indicators, you supply information to the stakeholders, for example, your product owner, to uh, help them establish the confidence that they will actually get the pursued business value. So when they have enough confidence, they will decide to go live and then the users will experience the real value. And then something interesting happens. Then you get this value improvement loop because they will come up with new ideas for additional value. And if you work DevOps, then you can go through this value improvement loop multiple times per day, every time releasing small pieces of additional value. By the way, this model, which we call a voice model for value objectives, indicators, confidence, and experience, um, this voice model applies not only to DevOps, but also to Scrum, where you have a value improvement loop of uh, two weeks in a sprint, or to traditional IT delivery, where the value improvement loop may even be longer. But especially in this workshop, we will look at high performance IT delivery, such as Scrum, DevOps, Agile in general. And it is an approach that enables cross-functional teams to continuously improve the products, processes, and the people that are required to deliver value. So it's not just about creating IT products, it's also about improving your IT delivery processes and improving the people at the same time. So high performance IT delivery is about quality and it is about quality of products, processes, and people. And uh, that's what I call the three Ps. Um, so it's important not just to focus on the product, but to focus on improving the quality of all of those. Now, I already mentioned high performance IT delivery. Our book is called Quality for DevOps Teams, but DevOps to me is the next step after Scrum. So basically, uh, what I tell you is not only for DevOps, if you think we're not there yet, no problem, because what we are looking into is also just for plain uh, agile and even for hybrid models, like, for example, the Scaled Agile Framework. So this is a broad scope on everything that has an agile mindset. Now, um, I uh, this conference is about testing, but basically I prefer to use the word quality engineering today. And quality engineering is broader than testing. Now, first let's have a quick look, what is quality engineering? Um, because the first time I heard the term was like five years ago, and then we couldn't find a definition. So we made one ourselves and, and put it in our book. And our definition is this, quality engineering is about team members and their stakeholders taking joint responsibility. So that means everybody takes responsibility together. And for what? to continuously deliver IT systems with the right quality at the right moment to the business people and their customers. So this is not about the highest possible quality. It is about the right quality. And sometimes mediocre quality today is much better than the highest possible quality in two years from now. Uh, because very good quality too late still doesn't deliver business value. So it's about right quality at the right moment. And of course, quality engineering is a principle of software engineering concerned with applying the right quality measures to assure the quality of IT systems. So here again, we talk about having certain quality measures and quality measures are activities that you do to make sure there's enough quality. And there are three groups of quality measures. And this is important because in the quality engineering strategy, you will see that the template that we're going to use is based on these three groups. So the first group, and in my opinion, the most important is the group of quality measures that aims at building quality in from the start. 
Uh, we, today we talk about built-in quality because long time ago, I already learned that if you want to add quality later, it is an awful lot of work. Whereas if you build quality right from the start, it makes your whole process much easier. So we're talking about build quality in, try to do things right first time. And these quality measures traditionally are called preventive quality measures. And I think it's a bit of a negative term because it is about preventing problems where I like to talk about building quality in, which is basically the same, but it sounds much nicer. But anyway, this is a well-known term. Then the second group of quality measures are the quality measures that help you to provide information about quality and risks. These are the so-called detective quality measures coming from the idea that you want to detect problems, whereas I prefer to use testing to do not detect problems, but just to see that everything is okay. Yeah? Because uh, uh, some testers get very insecure if they don't find any problems. But if you organize your testing well, and you don't find any problems, that means that you have high quality software. And that is what you would like, isn't it? So therefore, it is about providing information about quality and risks. Hopefully, the information is it's very good quality. But if it's not, and some risks are remaining, then at least you give information where the quality can be improved. And to improve stuff, we have the so-called corrective quality measures, which is, of course, about bug fixing. But far more important in quality engineering is also proactive quality improvement. Things like refactoring. Eh? You have a piece of code, it's working fine, but still you try to optimize it. So that's it. So we have these three groups of quality measures, preventive, detective, and corrective, or rather building quality in, providing information on quality and risks, and proactive quality improvement. Now, I wonder, uh, do you know definitions of testing? And most people that have been in the testing business have seen multiple definitions of testing. If you really would be interested, I, I wrote a blog on the history of the definition of testing, and there's quite some different definitions. Uh, but today, we use this definition. And the definition is as follows. Testing consists of verification, validation, and exploration activities that provide information about the quality and the related risks to establish the level of confidence that a test object will be able to deliver the pursued business value. So if we look at the picture, the picture starts with the test object, which can be anything like a small piece of code or a end-to-end uh, -end business process. And then we do three things. Now, many of you will probably have heard of verification and validation in a definition of testing, but we added exploration. And let me quickly uh, describe that with a uh, somewhat funny example. I, I still have this old desk calculator on my uh, uh, table here. And suppose the requirements document of this desk calculator says one plus one is three. So obviously there has been a typo, eh? it's, it's wrong, but nobody noticed. So we have this specification that says one plus one is three. And if I do verification, I just check if it is built according to specification. So I do one plus one. If the result is three, verification is okay. It passes because we built what was asked for. Luckily, there's also validation because any math teacher will tell you that one plus one is actually two. So it is not fit for purpose if it is one plus one is three. So validation fails. So that's verification and validation. It's about the stated uh, requirements and the implied needs. But then you may wonder, what about exploration? Well, when I first got a calculator, which was in high school, I was one of the first kids allowed to use a calculator in high school. And um, 
uh, quickly we learned that if you enter a number and then you turn it upside down, you could read funny texts. And that is, uh, I, I'm sure there is no specification document in the world that says that calculators should write funny texts. So you only find that through exploration. Now, of course, this is a funny example, but now imagine, for example, security testing. So you do verification where you check whether there is a user ID and a password, and after several times a wrong password, uh, it blocks. So that's all in the requirements. Then you have validation where you check fit for purpose. And for example, a regular employee has less rights than a senior employee. So hey, you check whether it all fits their roles, which is more like validation and in the business process. And then we have exploration where you have your ethical hackers that try to get around your uh, login screen huh? and, and try to do other things that were not in the specifications. It's not fit for purpose, but it is possible. So that's why we say verification, validation and exploration are important. And they deliver information about quality and the related risks uh, because I always say quality is the things you do want and risks are the things you don't want. And if you have enough information, then your stakeholder will have confidence that they will get their business value. So that's the foundation of why we are, are doing all of this and why we do quality engineering. So let's go to the quality engineering strategy and the workshop part of this uh, afternoon. So the goal is built in quality and the quality engineering strategy relates quality measures with IT delivery items uh, such as user stories, etc., and indicates the intensity of the quality measures that are needed. So an important thing in the quality engineering strategy is that you do not approach everything with the same quality measure because if you have high risks, you need higher intensity of your quality measures. So you want to take an other quality measure than if you have a low risk. So that's basically what the whole quality engineering strategy is all about. Now, on my next slide, you will see some pictures that you can't read, and that's not a problem. It's just giving you a quick overview of what we are going to do. And after that, we're diving into the template and the template you are going to download yourself so you will be able to see it properly. But first, let me quickly give you the overview of the quality engineering strategy. It starts with IT delivery items, such as user stories, features, whatever. For every uh, IT delivery item, you determine the re relevant quality attributes, quality characteristics like security, usability, performance, whatever. And then we determine a risk class. And high risk means higher intensity of our quality measures. Low risk me means lower intensity. You may remember from testing that people say uh, high risk, a lot of testing, low risk, little testing, no risk, no testing. And I always add no risk means if it fails, nobody has a problem. So we don't need it. So we won't develop it. Then we have the least kind of risk that it will fail. But anyway, high risk, more intense quality measures than with low risk. So that's why we want to have a risk class. And then we determine the intensity using bullets and we determine the quality measures that need to be taken. Um, and how we do that, we will see in a minute. So the template, and I'll show to you, and I'm going to, so this is the website, tmap.net. Tmap.net is the uh, um, body of knowledge uh, website and almost all of the knowledge that is in our book is also on the website. You can access it freely. Of course, you can also buy the book in, in uh, electronic form or in paper uh, version, but you can also just have a look at the website. And on the website, we have several uh, menus and of course, you can guess we go to the download menu and there we select templates, quite obvious 
So you go to templates. And then in the templates, we have first some organizing templates, which we are going to skip. And then you find performing templates. And why they're called organizing and performing is a nice story, but not for now. I don't have time for that. So we'll browse down until you find quality engineering strategy table template. Quality engineering strategy table template. And you can download it in English, as you can see, or in Spanish. So if you like, you can download in Spanish. And we are working on other languages as well, but at this moment we have English and Spanish. So I click on this one and then we get the final download link. I click on the download link and it actually downloads here. And um, well, I'll just open it from here. You can also have first store it somewhere on your hard disk and open it from there, whatever you like. And then, oh, and then of course it opens on my other monitor. So just a moment, I'll shift it so that you can also see it. Uh, oh. So this is the result. And hopefully you all also were able to download the thing. Uh, it opens on the first page, which is the quality engineering strategy explanation. Well, I'm going to explain to you in this workshop. Um, there's all kinds of information here. Well, we'll skip it for the moment. And then we have the template. I will reduce it a little bit so that it gets in view. Oh, this is maybe too much. 85 would be great, I think. Okay, so we have the template and I also have to make sure that I can edit it. That's the security stuff of my employer. Okay, so we'll get back to this, but first let me return to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Where is it? And here it is. So, I hope by now you all managed to download the quality engineering strategy. We are going to use a case in this workshop and the case is about quality land and quality land is our imaginary amusement park, uh, something like Disneyland or uh, other kinds of these things. And we use quality land throughout all of the examples of TMAP because, well, most people simply like to go to amusement parks, at least I do. So we have this Im imaginary amusement park with roller coasters and other rides. And in this amusement park, they have a new user story. What they want to do is they want to give their visitors a sneak preview of the rides in virtual reality. So people are at home with their virtual reality goggles and they can already experience what awaits them in quality land and then hopefully get more eager to get there. So what they do is they go to the quality land website, select the ride they want to take and put their VR headset on and enjoy the experience. So this is the user story. It's quite a simple, short user story, not too many details there, but it is the user story and like we saw in the template, the first part of the template is where we fill in the user stories. So at this time, we only have one user story and that's it. Um, let me quickly do that so that you can see what I mean. So uh, user story VR preview. Well, whatever you call it. So that's the first thing I fill in. By the way, you also see the words generic here. Um, don't mind that for the moment. Later, I will explain what these generic lines are all about. But for the moment, we look at the IT delivery items and we have one IT delivery item, which is our user story. Okay, so going back to my presentation slide. Now, the next step in the template is quality characteristics. 
And we have a chat box and let's try if it works. So what quality characteristics do you know? Um, uh, can be anything uh, related to, to yeah, quality. They are also known as the functionals and non-functionals. So if you know some examples, please put them in the chat. Now I hope the chat is working because I don't see anything coming in yet. We should be with about 20 people. So I hope at least somebody knows uh, a quality characteristic. Ah, there they are coming in. So user experience, usability, performance. Yeah, they are great examples. Any more examples? Stability, security. Yeah. Functionality. Yeah, of course. Eh? Functionality is uh, probably the quality characteristics that is most used in testing. Eh? A lot of testing is just functionality. And all too often, we forget about all the other uh, quality characteristics. Well, let's have a look. Uh, in our book, we use the ISO 25010 standard. And most people know the part for product quality in the ISO standard. And the product quality part, oh, sorry, is about uh, functionality, performance, compatibility, usability, reliability, security, maintainability, and portability, where functionality is functional testing and the others are the non-functional part. Um, but what fewer people know is that the ISO standard also has quality in use characteristics like effectiveness, efficiency, satisfaction, freedom from risk, and context coverage. Some people tell me there is no safety in the ISO standards because we do have security, but no safety. But please know that safety is part of freedom from risk because all of the quality characteristics have some sub-characteristics. If you would like to know more, go to the TMAP website, just enter a, a quality characteristic in the search field and you will find all the information. But so they have sub-characteristics and one of the sub-characteristics of freedom from risk is uh, health and safety risk. Now, a couple of years ago, together with my colleagues, I was writing this book, just a moment, the book uh, Testing in the Digital Age, AI Makes the Difference. So it is about testing of AI and testing with AI, testing using AI. But if you test AI, so testing products that include AI, you still need to use all these quality characteristics. The only thing we noticed is that it was not enough. So in our book, we added three extra quality characteristics for intelligent machines, which is intelligent behavior. So is it actually intelligent? And I can tell you most AIs are not very intelligent. Second one is morality. That is about things like uh, ethics, privacy, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and the last one is personality, because when, for example, you have a chatbot and it is for teenagers, the chatbot will use other languages than if you make a chatbot for senior citizens, eh? because old people use other words. So that is an example of personality. And then recently in, in the book Quality for DevOps Teams, we added another quality characteristic, which is sustainability, which is about caring for the environment, but also for social uh, aspects of that. So sustainability is about uh, environment, economics, and social uh, sustainability. Well, enough about these quality characteristics in detail. Back to our uh, workshop and now the idea is that you fill in in uh, the, the template and I'll show you where so we are now in this column of the template and there you fill in the quality characteristics that you think are relevant for our user story so we have a user story and we don't have 
too much time, although we do have some time, eh, but we don't have an abundance of time. So therefore, I would say select your top three quality characteristics and then please put them in the uh, template. And what we usually do is if you have uh, the possibility to enter multiple things, what I normally do is uh, I... Oh, just a moment. Where is it? So I use these uh, three lines for one user story. Uh, so that is somewhere here. So we combine the fields. We have one IT delivery item here. Uh, and we have three uh, quality characteristics. So... Um, and of course, normally you don't know upfront how many quality characteristics you will have. So you will later combine them. But in this case, well, we were lucky that we know that we only want to have three. So think about, and then to help you, what I will now do is show the list of quality characteristics again. And then you think, what are your top three quality characteristics for the virtual reality uh, experience? And after you put them in your Excel sheet, also please put them in the chat box so that I can see what kind of quality characteristics you have thought are most relevant for our uh, VR experience. Um, and just as a remark in general, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to uh, ask questions, you can you do that in the chat box or you can uh, turn on your microphone if that possibility is enabled. I'm not sure if it's enabled for all participants, but uh, you could at least try. And um, so let's see, how are you doing? Are there people already having determined what they think is the most uh, relevant quality characteristic for our VR, VR glasses. So I see Zoltan saying uh, functionality, performance and compatibility. Well, I can imagine. On the other hand, I can also imagine that some other people may think other quality characteristics are more important. Um, for example, uh, Armagan says uh, usability and portability. Um, and that, of course, depends. Will people use their own VR glasses or are they given out by Quality Lens? But if people use their own VR glasses, portability is probably uh, an important thing because it needs to work on all um, VR glasses. And... Um, Schnee and Eleni talk about satisfaction, for example. Well, of course, that's an important thing eh? because the most important thing is, is your audience satisfied with the solution? And especially in this situation, maybe they are very happy with a simple solution uh, and then that's good enough, even though uh, some other aspects may not be brilliant. On the other hand, I know that with VR glasses, performance is very important because if the image is a little bit too slow, people get very dizzy very soon. Um, so anyway, you all put in some of the quality characteristics and um, well, let me put in well, functionality that's almost always there then we can say, uh, what will I take? Well, let me take satisfaction and uh, portability. But you, if you have others, that is not uh, uh, that is not a bad thing. Uh, it's okay if you have others. Fine with me, no problem. Um, so, what we now have is we know our user story. We know the quality characteristics that are important. So let's go to the next step. And the next step, oh yeah, this is what we already have. Um, yeah. So the next step is the risk class. Now, why is risk important? Usually 
you should have a quality strategy and policy and a test policy. And so normally an organization should have a quality and test policy. They may be different things. I'm currently working with a large organization in, in transporting in the Netherlands where we are defining their quality policy and their test policy as separate things. But I've also worked with an insurance company where they had a combined quality and test policy. So it's just what you like. And on our website, we have, uh, you, you see the picture on the right, uh, the nine important uh, subjects of a quality and test policy. So there you can see what should be on it. But in general, you talk about risk-based quality engineering. That means high risk, high intensity quality measures, medium risk, medium intensity quality measures, low risk, low intensity quality measures, and no risk. Well, I already gave it away a couple of minutes ago. Low risk means nobody needs it because if it fails, nobody has a problem. So nobody needs it. So no development. Yeah? And this is really something I learned uh, in practice that sometimes people, for example, marketing people, come up with new ideas of things that a system could do. And then you ask them, what's the risk if it fails? And they say, no, no, there's not much risk. And then, well, who actually needs it? Because sometimes we spend an awful lot of time developing stuff that no user ever thought they would need. And then there are two possible things. One is nobody ever uses it, so it was a waste of time to make it. But far more a problem is that nobody ever thought they needed it, but then it gets developed. They say no risk, so we hardly do any testing. So it's not very good quality. And then everybody thinks, hey, we have a new possibility. So let's start using it. And then it fails. And then you get a lot of complaints that something fails that nobody knew they needed before. So no risk, nobody needs it, no development. Um, now, what is risk? Here you see someone climbing a mountain. And I use this picture a lot. And I ask groups, hey, what do you think about the risk? And then some people say, well, uh, this person is secured to a rope. So probably the risk is low. And then I ask, well, do we know for certain that the rope is tight, yeah, is fixed to something, or is it just a loose rope? And if this person falls, the rope falls with them. So you never know. The other thing is, is this a skilled climber yeah, with a lot of experience? Then the risk is much less than if this is the first time ever that this person uh, does climbing. Yeah? So that's all about the chance of something going wrong. Then we also have the, oh, and that's this, chance of something going wrong. Another thing is frequency. So if this climber climbs every day of the year, the chance of falling is much more than if they only climb one day a year, because you just simply do it more often. So that's the chance of failure. The other thing is impact. What would be the impact if this person, uh, well, loses up, falls off? Well, Actually, with this picture, we don't know the actual impact because just below the picture, there may be a huge cushion yeah, and people fall on and nothing happens. On the other hand, it may also be a thousand meter gap. And if they fall, well, it's going to be catastrophic. So risk is a combination of chance and impact. Now, one thing I would like to know is how do we determine the effort to build software? Yeah, so if we want to build a piece of software, usually we do something like planning poker. And then the question is, yeah, and planning poker, by the way, is a totally wrong name. Did you know that? Because planning poker doesn't give you a planning. It gives you the size. Yeah? So maybe it should be sizing poker because it gives you the size of, for example, a piece of software. Now, if you have, if you know the size of the piece of software, then how much effort do you need for that size? Well, in general, every uh, uh, agile team that does planning poker has their own frame of reference, but let's say their velocity uh, indicates that 
if we have uh, a user story of five story points, it will take them, let's say, 10 hours, two hours per story point. I have no clue eh, because it differs in every team, but let's say two hours per story point. Now, do you get more hours per story point for building your code, eh, so writing your code, if the risk is high or low? What do you think? Is high, high risk code, does it take more time to write or does it take the same time to write as low risk software? So please put in the chat if you think it takes more time to write high risk code than, uh, or does it take the same time? What do you think? And Armagan and uh, Wanda already say the same. Well, I generally agree. Uh, writing a number of lines of code just takes the time it takes to write a number of lines of code. But then another question. The effort for quality engineering and testing, does that differ for high or low risk? So do we more testing for high risk than we do for low risk? What do you think? Now, I'm not sure if Nassim is responding to my previous question or the current question, but okay. So other people say more testing is needed. Yeah, yeah, sorry, previous question. Well, still, Nassim, I agree with your statement because you say the architecture may take longer if it is high risk. And that is the whole of my point because uh, we need to differentiate our efforts based on risk but not only our efforts for testing, which everybody thinks is very normal, eh, that we do more testing with high risk than with low risk. And the reason for that is that we can never do all testing. Eh? So with writing code, you write code until you are finished because you have to write all of the code. But with testing, there are so many possibilities that you can never do all the tests. So testers have been used to differentiating their approach, more testing in high risk, less testing in low risk, because you can't do everything anyway. Now, the interesting thing here is that if you want to focus on building in quality from the start, which is the basic idea of quality engineering, you also may want to spend more effort on the development activities. And therefore, I'm very happy with Nassim's uh, remark, because if you have high risk, probably you should spend a little more time on architecture. For example, if your risk would be a performance risk, then architecture is very important eh? because one technical solution may perform much better than another technical solution. Whereas the rest of the effort for building it may be the same, but still it will impact the quality and in this case specifically the performance part of your quality. So therefore I would say not only differentiate the testing activities, but also all of the other uh, activities. Okay, so this is why we use risk. Now, how do you determine the risk? Because like we saw in the Oh, now I'm going wrong, sorry. In the template we saw, we want to put in a risk class and you can only put in A, which is high or B, which is medium or C, which is low. So you can enter A, B, C and that's it. Um, how do we get to these A, B and C? Well, for that, what we can do is we can use uh, risk poker. And what is risk poker? Risk poker is similar to planning poker. And usually you first do risk poker and then you do planning poker. Um, and risk poker is done only with the cards one, two, and three. And one is low, two is medium, three is high. Now, some teams just do one round of pokering. They throw down a one for low, a two for medium, a three for high and that's it and then we translate one to a c two to a b and three to an a maybe a little bit awkward but 
who cares? Oh, but on the other hand, it is better and takes a little more time, but it's better to do pokering for chance and for impact. Yeah, because like we saw, the risk depends on the chance that something goes wrong and the impact if it actually goes wrong. So what happens? We first look at chance. The team members, they throw their cards. There are two with a different opinion. They have a discussion to exchange views. Why would it be a one? Why would it be a three? And then they poker again. In this case, they all agree that it should be two. So the Scrum Master writes down two for the chance of failure. They do the same thing for impact. Well, same thing here also, the result is two. So the Scrum Master now has two for chance, two for impact, and now do it needs to determine, is this an A, a B, or a C? For this, we created this table. And actually we created this table a very long time ago because we also used it for our test strategy. And now we use it for our quality engineering strategy. So the table exists for more than 15 years already. And what you can see here is, oh, sorry, is if we have a medium chance and a medium impact, that will result in a B. So we have risk class B, which is medium risk. Um, if you have high, high, it would be A, low, low, it would be C. And then maybe you will notice something irregular in this table because it is not uh, uh, totally the same eh? because low chance, high impact gets a B where high chance, low impact gets a C because impact is slightly more important than chance. Because something that fails very often, but nobody has a problem, yeah, still is low risk. Whereas something that has a very low chance of happening, but if it happens, it has very high impact, then it is uh, a higher risk. So that's why we have a B for low chance, high impact. If, by the way, in your situation, you want to use another table. For example, you think medium high and high medium also should be an A. Be my guest there. Eh? This is just a suggestion of how to do it. And by the way, this also goes for our nice Excel template. It is just a template. If you want to do it another way, for example, I know a team they have copied all this information in Jira. Eh? So in Jira, they register all their tasks and also they register their quality engineering strategy elements in Jira, which is fine with me because the template is just to help you do your work properly. Anyway, so in one way or another, you determine the risk class, high, medium, or low. So let's go to our uh exercise again and uh now it's up to you to uh determine the risk so what you have done is you have three quality characteristics for the user story and then the idea is that you determine if you think this is a high risk or a medium risk or a low risk and oh why doesn't this work? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I just fill in ABC, didn't give it a thought. Uh, just as an example, I'll give you one or two minutes to think about your uh, how you filled it in. Have a look at the user story. I'll, I'll show the user story again. And then think, okay, you have three quality characteristics. Which one is high? which one medium, which one low. And, and just for the sake of the exercise, it would be nice if you do one high, one medium, and one low. In real life, of course, it may be that all three of them are high or low. Eh? That, uh, that depends on the situation. But um, for now, it would be nice if you assign a medium and a, or a high, a medium, and a low. And it would be nice if some of you put your solution also in the chat so that I get an idea of what you have filled in, just, just so that I know a bit what you're doing. Okay, Nassim says uh, functionality, compatibility, performance. 
And for this exercise, it's no problem. Eh? In, in real life, it is. If it is about uh, VR glasses, I would definitely put performance on high because I have a little experience with VR glasses. And I know that if the performance is not okay, it ruins the whole experience. So in, in real life, we would put high on performance. But for now, for this exercise, it doesn't matter much because we just need these high, medium and low for uh, the next steps. Oh, and here Vanda is showing a nice one. Let me have a look. So portability, a B, medium risk, performance, A. Well, I agree. Functionality, a B. Yeah, functionality still should be quite okay. Yeah? And satisfaction, a C. Okay, well, uh, yeah, so we don't care too much whether people like it or not. Well, this may be an example if it is in a company. Yeah? Some companies, they use VR experience for educating their people and then they care a little less whether the people like it much as long as they uh, get the learning objectives anyway so i think everybody by now has found some risk classes so let's go to the next step um and the next step is determine the intensity the intensity per group of quality measures now remember and i'll show the template again we have three groups of quality measures. We have built quality in, which we also call the preventive quality measures. We have demonstrate the quality level, which basically is testing. And since we have static testing, which is uh, reviewing, uh, code analysis, whatever, and we have dynamic testing. So that's why the demonstrate quality level is double uh, related to the others and we have improved the quality with the corrective quality measures so we have four main columns and all of them have two sub columns and that is because first we will assign the bullets so um oh yeah and then i have to talk about these bullets but now i forgot did i have a slide for that i think i did yes i have so um so we'll look into the Excel sheet in a minute. First, let's look at this bullet idea. So if we have risk class A, we want high test intensity or basically, oh, I should have said quality uh, measure intensity. Ah, that's an improvement for myself. Well, so high quality measure intensity, and that means three bullets. So three bullets means high intensity, two bullets is medium, one bullet is low, and of course, with no risk, we don't uh, we don't have the user story at all eh, if there's no risk, or at least we don't have the quality characteristic for this user story. Um, now, what it actually means is um, the more bullets, the more intensity. So if you have a risk class A in at least one of the columns, you need to have three bullets not necessarily in all columns eh? so uh, you have a, in at least one column you have three bullets if you have risk class b there is at least two bullets somewhere but nowhere there's more than two bullets and if you have risk class c you can only have one bullet or no bullets and then by assigning these bullets you show how do you want to approach the quality the quality engineering um of course if you like you and you have a very good reason you may deviate what for example i have seen in practice we wanted to assign three bullets to i think it was user acceptance testing we we had a high risk and we wanted to do a user acceptance testing with three bullets and then everybody from the user department had very little time so they simply did not have time to do three bullet high intensity user acceptance testing so we solved that by changing uh, user acceptance testing to two bullets and adding some more system testing that before that we had it only one bullet but then we changed it also to two bullets and our idea was if we do both system testing medium and user acceptance testing medium that will also cover our risk so that kind of things you may consider but the basic idea is if you have an A 
somewhere must be three bullets. If you have a B, somewhere must be two bullets and no more than that. And with a C, only one bullet. So that's the basic ID. Um, so we're back to the user story. And now the idea is that you, for your user story combination with quality characteristics, you put in the bullets you like. And why is this important? Well, for example, for functionality, I might say I have a high risk. I do a lot of um, built-in quality measures. So I make sure that I design very well and develop the code very well, for example, with pair programming to make sure that it's very well developed. And then I can do, uh, let's say, a little reviewing. I do... Um, well, still probably want to do proper testing. And I do a little bit of corrective quality measures because if we develop it very well, then we don't need to correct that much. On the other hand, with, for example, satisfaction is very difficult to determine with uh, in the built-in stage and probably will we'll, uh, determine the satisfaction with user acceptance testing, and maybe some reviewing. So this is the kind of thing and the discussion you will have in your team. And what you will notice in real life is that in the beginning, this gives an awful lot of discussion because it's new to everybody. But if you have done this a couple of times, then you have just like, if you know planning poker, you know that the first time you do it gives a lot of discussion. And after a couple of times, Everybody has the same frame of reference, and then it becomes much more easy to assign the right uh, thing. So also with this, eh, assigning these bullets helps a lot. And now you may wonder, why do we first assign these bullets and don't think of quality measures right away? Well, that is because if you start talking about quality measures, it is difficult to still distinguish high from low impact or low intensity quality measures. So first we fill in the bullets, and when we have filled in all the bullets, then we continue. So I'll give you a little bit time to fill in some bullets in your situation. Try to fill in bullets at least in all four columns to give some idea. And if somebody feels like it, then please also put a screenshot in the chat so that we have a little bit of idea how you filled it in just to uh, yeah, to experience that. So I hope it's not too difficult to fill in these bullets. As a little fun fact, the, 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 the drop down list for the bullets is quite new. First, we had to copy and paste. Oh, this is not possible, by the way. First, we had to copy and paste the bullets, but now we have these drop down lists. This makes it much more easy. Okay, well, I hope that everybody has put some of the bullets in. Um, at the beginning, Eggman said that I could have some breaks if I liked, but I now notice that we only have some 13 minutes left. And um, I think, well, I hope, uh, let me say it for myself, I, I can still manage for 13 minutes without a break. So I hope you can also, so bear with me for the last uh, bit. I think we need another 10 minutes or so, and then we still have some time for some Questions and answers, uh, if you like. Um, okay, so what we did is fill in the bullets. And now we come to the next step. And the next step is all about the uh, quality measures. So it is about quality measures. And what is a quality measure? A quality measure is a group of activities that is aimed at achieving a certain level of quality. Now, I know from experience, eh, well, I'm from the Netherlands where we speak Dutch, eh, so English is not our native language. 
And I know, and 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 probably uh, I think a lot of people that are on this conference also don't have English as their first language. And I know that the word quality measure often gives confusion because measure in English is a word with two meanings. One meaning of the word measure is to measure something. So to see how long it is or how heavy or whatever. That is the verb to measure. But also the word measure can be used as activity. So a measure is an, an activity or a group of activities that you take to get some kind of goal. Now here we use the word quality measure as a group of activities aimed at achieving a certain level of quality. And now I'm going to make it a little bit more confusing, but also if you get it, then you really understand what a quality measure is, because an example of a quality measure is testing, and testing measures the quality. So we have a quality measure, testing, that actually measures the quality. So now I hope you understand why sometimes there is confusion when I use the word quality measure. Here we mean a group of activities. Um, and then of course, I have a question to you all, and please use the chat again. What quality measures do you know? Well, you know one of them, testing, eh? or maybe in more detail, uh, um, dynamic testing and static testing, like reviewing. But there are many more. So I'm very curious what other quality characteristics you know. And maybe there are also some people in this group who think, well, beats me. I have no clue what other quality measures. Then in a few moments, I will give you a big help. But for the moment, let's first see what quality measures people come up with. And don't be shy. There are very many uh, quality measures. We, we actually have a list of more than 100. Checklist. Yeah, great example. Inspections. Yeah, also great example. Audits. Inspections and audits are basically quality measures that are detective. Huh? So they give information about the quality. Uh, health checks. Yeah. Oh, that's a health check is nice. Is that preventive, detective, or correct? Yeah, well, the health check itself is detective. And uh, if it detects that the health is not good enough, then you'll probably do a corrective quality measure next to it. Anyway, let's have a look. Um, so here are some examples. Um, for building quality in, an example is pair programming. If two people uh, work together to build a piece of code, the quality of the code will be generally higher than when only one person does it. Another quality measure is definition of done. By describing what the quality level is that you want to meet, you already make sure that you get a more equal level of quality because everybody complies with your definition of done and this way make sure they build the right level of quality. For demonstrating the quality level, we have things like reviewing, but also test design and the famous test design techniques, uh, test execution, definitely, but also things like code analysis. Eh? There are automatic tools today that analyze code, both statically and dynamically, uh, to give you information about the quality level. And last but not least, we have the quality measures to improve the quality. And there you can think of things like feature toggles, where you can change the quality of your system without changing the code itself. Um, or uh, refactoring, where you have a well-working piece of code, but still you try to improve it further. So there are quite a number. Now, remember when I talked about the Oh, this is the wrong one. When I talked about the template, I told you there is generic and the IT delivery items. 
And there is a reason for that. Because we have specific and generic quality measures. And the specific quality measures are applied for IT delivery items. So depending on the intensity and the needs of the relevant quality attribute, we have different quality measures that apply for that specific user story with that specific quality characteristic. And examples are four Amigo session. And if you don't know four Amigos, but you do know three Amigos, then remember that three Amigos come from Agile, where we have the business analyst, the developer, and the tester being the three Amigos. And if we do DevOps, we add the operations person as the fourth Amigo. So that's why we have four Amigos. It's basically perspective-based reviewing. Um, you can have performance, usability, that kind of testing, uh, feature toggles. Well, we discussed them. And then generic quality measures. And generic quality measures apply to all user stories. So for example, a definition of ready, it describes when a user story is good enough to be put on your sprint backlog. So as long as it doesn't meet the definition of ready, it will never enter your sprint backlog. Same for de definition of done. When are we done with our work? Well, that is the definition of done that specifies for all of your user stories. Same goes for coding standards. Coding standards also apply for everything. Now, you may judge by the general risk you run with your system, what kind of generic quality measures you will apply. For example, if you are building new software for a sending a satellite to space, then probably you want higher quality uh, measures, so uh, uh, higher intensity quality measures than when you are just building the website for your local amateur football club or so. So uh, depending on the needs, you have different quality measures. Um, so, and now comes what I promised you. Where is it? Um, if you don't know that many quality measures, then here's the trick. List of quality measures. And let's go there. And this list of quality measures, you find the four groups. Eh? So build quality and preventive, demonstrate quality static, demonstrate quality dynamic, and improve quality corrective. And there you can fold them open. So this little plus, if you click it, it shows you, oh, and I have to shift a bit to the left. It shows you first a number of generic quality measures that would go for all of your user stories. And then it shows you specific quality measures that are specifically to one user story or maybe to some. Eh? By the way, the, the distinction between generic and specific is not 100% always true because you may, for example, decide, let's take this example. It may that you decide that you want all uh, uh, testing done with ATDD, and then you make it a generic uh, quality measure. So this is the list of the quality measures. Um, and then by selecting from the list, you, you can say, well, I like this quality me measure. Uh, we have a test design technique called path testing. And uh, that is our oh, preferred quality measure. So for uh, here, we do uh, path testing. Oh, well, typo there. Oh, I'm very bad at typing. Well, anyway. So this is how you fill in your quality measures. Now we are running towards the end of the workshop. So what I would like to ask you is take your time after the end of the workshop to quietly look around in the quality measures and fill in some of the quality measures that you feel uh, like. And then of course, I call upon you to try this in real life. Try it in your project, discuss with people, Keep in mind that this template is there to help you. Eh? It's not to limit you. Eh? So it's not that you must do things because the template says so. No, it is that 
you want to differentiate your approach based on risk. So one part gets more attention because it's high risk. Another part gets less attention because it's low risk. And that way you can uh, spend your uh, precious time uh, as proper as possible. Um, so in the end, we'll have an example like this. And that is the uh, basic idea of the quality engineering strategy to help you determine what are the appropriate quality measures in your situation. And like you see, sometimes you fill in no bullets and then no uh, quality measure. And if you wonder why here nothing is filled in, well, this is just work in progress, so people were not ready yet. This brings me to the conclusion of my workshop. In the old days, the tester used to be the messenger of bad news, but that's no more because today we have quality engineering, which enables the team as a whole to deliver the business value that people are searching after. Um, if you would like to know more, go to tmap.net. Uh, you already know the website by now. Or you can read in the book, which you can find on ictbooks.com or in on Amazon or wherever you like. Maybe you're also interested in the uh, TMAP training courses. You can find more information on tmap.net and uh, on uh, tmapcert.com, the TMAP certification website hosted by ISQI. And of course, you already know the TMAP website. That was what I wanted to tell.